Oscar is so fascinating because not only is he, I mean the obvious, he's absolutely gorgeous. He's a strong fighter, he's a hard puncher, he's a smart boxer, and on top of that he has so much heart. At first I just resented the sport, I just could not deal with boxing because it was such a brutal sport. Getting hit and crying and I just couldn't take it. Boxing is image and the image was the golden boy and both in the ring and out of the ring he's been less than perfect. You got this guy who's a tough, this champion of the world in a sport that's probably one of the most brutal sports there is. And for him to be crying, a grown man cry, with the birth of his child, of, of, his, of his little boy, of his little girl, was incredible. He's fragile. He has fragility. I think the public sees him in the ring, the public sees him at his press conferences, the public sees the bravado, uh, but the public doesn't see him sitting in a restaurant uh, after he's just lost and looking bewildered and confused and inhuman. And he is. He's a great athlete, he's a five-time world champ, he's won the gold medal. He's got every girl on the planet wanting to sleep with him, you know, and, and here he <laughs> is, you know, he's a singer too. My God, it's, I mean, it's impossible. Oscar de la Hoya was born on February 4, 1973, in a predominantly Latino section of East Los Angeles. He was the second of three children to Mexican immigrants, Joel and Cecilia de la Hoya. They were a poor working class family on food stamps, a fact that Oscar never forgot. A food stamp in my wallet is a food stamp that's from many years ago. I think about the, the struggling we had to face. Um, Sometimes putting food on the table. Just rough, tough times. Oscar's parents worked hard to make ends meet. They grew up in a really ugly neighborhood where I did as well. And uh, there was a lot of gang activity, uh, a lot of violence out in the streets. So the father was really, really strict with his kids. And uh, trying to obviously steer them away from any trouble whatsoever. Oscar was a typical kid in East L.A. who went to school, hung out with his friends, and loved to skateboard. He also had a passion for drawing. He used to like to draw. He'd always draw whenever he had a chance in class, after school. He won this contest once. There was a contest in a magazine, I believe, I believe it was a magazine, where uh, you had to draw this picture that they had on, in this magazine. And he drew and he won. When Oscar wasn't drawing, he'd follow his older brother wherever he went. One of those places was to the East Side Boxing Club. He always wanted to tag along, you know, with the older brother. And I was like, get away, kid. You know, shoo, don't bother, you know. Kind of like a gnat, you know, in your ear. Get away, get away. <laughs> Joe Jr. was the first to be involved in boxing. So he was like around nine years in Oscar, around six and a half, something like that. The problem was that uh, my oldest boy didn't like boxing, you know, but he was, I think uh, he was better than Oscar. And Oscar uh, was in love with the sport of boxing. So he, he, was, uh, he was all the time at the gym. At first I just, I resented the sport. I just could not deal with boxing because it was such a brutal sport. Getting hit and crying and I just couldn't take it. But my father, I was a very strict father. So I had no choice but to go to the gym every single day because of him taking me to the gym. And after several months, after years, I learned to love the sport. It was no coincidence that Joel Jr. and Oscar got into boxing since the De La Hoyas were a boxing family. Oscar's father was a professional boxer in the 60s, while Oscar's grandfather was an amateur in the 1940s. But Oscar had other sports on his mind. He used to play with the skateboards, and I had a little problem with him all the time. Oscar, don't do that. You know, don't do that because you might break your uh, hand, your uh, your foot, and and to be a boxer, you had to be 100% complete. Our father actually is the one that you know got us into it, obviously, and 
you know, if it wasn't for him pushing us and uh, leading us that path, you know, because uh, obviously living in East LA, you know, you get, you get sphered, you know, sphered the wrong way. And uh, uh, with their guidance, uh, you know, I mean, they uh, pushed us that direction. And I mean, for, you know, I, I love the sport, you know, but I wasn't really into it, you know. But uh, Oscar just, you know, found a passion for it. And uh, he stuck to it. My first boxing match, I remember the boxing gloves were probably bigger than my head at that time, I mean, they're huge gloves. But I was so excited to go up in the ring. I remember stopping the kid in the first round and um, I was so excited to receive that trophy, my very first trophy. It was a, a proud moment for me, especially for my father. I mean, he was like, oh my gosh, that's my boy, you know. It was a, it was a beautiful moment. Although Oscar's mother was also supportive of Oscar's newfound passion, she didn't really want him to box. I don't think she really approved of it, you know, it was more of my dad's idea and everything. But I mean, she still supported him 100%. You know, she was, I guess, his number one motivator. She just said, you know, work really hard at it, at it and um, you will accomplish it. She loved the sport of boxing and, uh, and uh, she never said nothing to Oscar. She all the time talked to Oscar and said, train hard, train hard if he wants something from life, you know. Even though she didn't like her son, being inside that ring, getting hit. She was always there supporting, yelling, screaming. Come on, Oscar, come on, come on, come on. Get in there. She was my number one fan, and she still is. With all of that love and support, Oscar just kept getting better in the ring, and his brother noticed that the hard way. You know, I used to, uh, <laughs> used to beat him up all the time, you know. Charlie's all the time, ah, oh, you know. And uh, one day, uh, I guess he kind of got fed up. He was already into the sport, you know, into boxing for a couple of years. And uh, I guess he got fed up one day and uh, he just, you know, clobbered me one in the stomach, knocked the wind out of me. And uh, since then, I, I haven't touched him. That was a pretty nice experience, not getting bullied around by my brother anymore. <laughs> it was becoming difficult for Oscar to find sparring partners to train with. It was hard for me to get sparring for him because it was too good. So we had to look for uh, other higher weights for him to spar and get ready for different tournaments. Oscar started winning every match he fought, and everyone noticed he was something special. He was always the best boxer, you know, he would always come home with the best box reward, and there was always talks of Oscar, you know, him being such a great fighter, and, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, was a sign there of, uh, you know, what was, you know, to come. Oscar was excelling in the ring, but having a harder time in the classroom. The balancing of his boxing career and his uh, being a student is, uh, was very difficult for him because they would call him out um, for training to different states, which meant he was away from school for a month, six weeks. So it meant that we had to get homework to him. However, Oscar was a um, very determined, single-minded, very focused young man. He lived for his boxing. He loved his boxing, and he had goals that he was going to achieve with his boxing. Everything he did was focused to that end. That focus brought Oscar to the Junior Olympics at 15 and the Golden Gloves at 17. He won both events. Oscar was then off to the Goodwill Games that same year. Unfortunately, his biggest fan, his mother, was battling breast cancer. She was very sick, and she asked me, uh, can I go to, to see Oscar at the Wigwood Games? I said, no, you can't, because you, you're sick. And uh, she said to me, I don't care, I want to see Oscar. For the last time, she said. My mother would skip chemotherapy so she can watch me fight, so she can go and, and cheer me on. If it was to me, I would, I would cancel my fights, my gosh, and go and, ta and tell you have to go to the hospital so we can get rid of this. She did it to be with her family, to not make us worry. And when I was eight years old, we had taken a road trip. My mother, I went with my mom over there. Since she was ill, I don't think she knows she could have fly and everything um, over there. But I mean, we were all so excited that, you know, it was finally, oh my God, you know, the Goodwill Games. And I remember her at the fights. She'd be yelling at him and like, you know, yeah, Oscar, hit him, hit him. And, you know, it was really excited, you know, that she was there. And um, 
I mean, and I know Oscar was really happy that we were there too. I do feel that he was being pulled apart, I'm sure by his mother's illness, because uh, he knew what she was going through, as well as um, being focused on his boxing. Those, I think, were his, um, his main concerns. And I think his boxing may have helped him work a lot of uh, anxiety, uh, worry out of his system. I remember one day she went to chemotherapy and I didn't know that she had cancer because I came back from school. She came back from the doctor. All of a sudden, she's quiet. She's, she's in tears. You know, I'm like, my gosh, what's wrong? So she starts telling me, you know, um, son, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. And when she said that, I, I just felt like destroyed. I felt destroyed. I felt like, like I just didn't want to live anymore because my mother is telling me she's dying, you know, so it, it, it was ugly. After Oscar's triumph at the Goodwill Games, he promised his mother on her deathbed that he would win the Olympics for her. On October 28, 1990, two months after the Goodwill Games, Cecilia de la Hoya lost her battle with breast cancer. Oscar had lost his biggest fan. Oscar De La Hoya dominated the amateur boxing ranks by 1991. He had won over 200 fights with his quickness and left jabs. But he was motivated by fear, the fear of not getting to the Olympics and fulfilling his mother's deathbed dream. I had no idea how I controlled the fear, the nerves that I had in me. I, I was petrified of, of failing, of not getting that gold medal. That was, I, I was worried about that, not fulfilling that goal, that dream. By November 1991, De La Hoya faced his fears and was 36-0 in world competition. The world championships in Sydney, Australia seemed like a perfect way to end a perfect year as the 1992 Olympics beckoned. I remember seeing film clips of him and being impressed with his incredible speed in the ring, both hands and feet. It was notable how his opponents always were taken by that immediately. He was so fast that they would hunt him down and he wasn't there. And they'd hunt him down again and he wasn't there. And, and while they were hunting, they'd get hit and they'd be on their back and it was all over. He's got this incredible ability to become a, 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 a vicious fighter in the ring, this Jekyll and Hyde transformation, and I've seen it. When he gets into the ring, he goes from being that nice guy into being uh, uh, this ferocious, uh, this look comes over his face, his eyes narrow, Everything else is gone, and, and he looks like he wants to kill the guy across the ring. And after a while, that wears on the other fighter, whose head is snapping backwards a hundred times more than yours is. And every time his head is snapping backwards, he has to kind of reload his gun and, and try to figure out how he can approach. And before he does that, his head snaps backwards again. While Oscar was the more ferocious fighter, Germany's Marco Rudolph better understood the international boxing rules and won the world championship. I didn't know how to handle it. I couldn't talk to family. I, would have, I was avoiding phone calls. I was avoiding everything because my first loss in so many years against Marco Rudolph, I was like, my gosh, I have to train harder or do something different. After the loss, Oscar was determined more than ever to win. But to get there, he had to get through the Olympic trials. 
He was young, but he was ready. He had a sense for what he had to do and how he had to do it, even at a young age, and he went out there and did it. He had set a goal. You know, his goal was to win that gold medal, and that's what he went out to do. In July of 1992, Oscar de la Hoya finally made it to the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. This was the event that he and his mother had dreamed about. As the eyes of the world were on him for the first time, de la Hoya was dominant from the opening bell, although the scoring system, once again, was not on his side. In Olympic style judging, they have a red button and a blue button. Now, I'll be the blue button, okay, the fighter, and my opponent is the red one. If I land a punch, there's four judges, or I believe it's five judges, who have to press that button within one second to get a, to get a point. So now, you throw a combination of five punches, the judges are not going to see that. They're going to press the button maybe twice, and another judge might be not even watching or paying attention, so it's very complicated. But the international scoring system was far from Oscar's mind. As the Olympic tournament progressed, Oscar disposed of his opponents one by one, though they weren't all easy victories. I said to myself, my gosh, I need three more and it's, it's, it's all over. I'm, I'm, I'll make her dream come true. I went on to fight this, this Korean kid. Now this Korean kid was, I mean, my heart just stopped because we were into the last round. He was ahead and all of a sudden the referee stops the fight and takes away points from the Korean because the Korean is holding me too much. And I'm like, oh my gosh. All I have to do now is just survive like 10 seconds and that's it, I win. The bell rang, I won 10 to nine. It, that was a miracle. I just didn't know how that happened. It was just incredible. After one more fight, Oscar advanced to the gold medal bout, which brought him face to face with Marco Rudolph, the same fighter who had defeated Oscar a year earlier at the World Championships. It's a very tight, very close match because I'm hesitating, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. The final round, um, there's about a minute left. And I'm like, you know, what, what do I have to do? I have to press the action. I have to be more aggressive. Out of the blue, I close my eyes and I throw this punch. So happens to land and drop him. And you get automatically two points for that. 10 seconds to left on the clock. And the bell rings and I win. And oh my gosh, I'm the happiest person on this earth. It was just incredible how that happened. A punch out of nowhere to win the fight. Oscar de la Hoya was the only U.S. boxer to bring home the gold that year. No matter what was the, the master plan at the Olympics for the Boxing Federation, Oscar was just too good to deny, and he, right to the end, he was too good to deny. He won a gold medal. Not only was Oscar an Olympic champion, he also fulfilled his mother's dying wish. I felt like as if they took out 50, 60 pounds of weight from my back. I felt so relieved that I fulfilled my mother's dream. And I was just thinking about her all the time, all the time. When I was on top of that podium, receiving the flowers they give you, receiving the gold medal, I was such in shock that I could swear I could swear to my life that my mother was there. It was just uh, an amazing experience. And then to think, oh, you know, your little brother's in there. I mean, it's only a once in a lifetime deal. And, you know, for me to be there and, uh, you know, experience that with my brother was, you know, it's a feeling I like no other. Ooh, I feel like a, like a big rooster. I'm happy, you know, very proud. The only one on, on that time, 92 Olympics. So I was very happy. When he came back from the Olympics, you know, he, he arrived to the airport coming from Spain and everything. And I mean, it was exciting. I mean, full, I mean, there was a lot of people, you know? I mean, the airport was packed with press, fans, our family. And um, I remember the first person he was looking for was me. He, you know, he had said, you know, oh, you know, Ceci, we did it. You know, we won the gold medal and everything. And, um, I remember him putting it around my neck. And, and you know, he just said it for our mom, you know? <laughs> the 
It was a big party, big old block party. It was a party for days. It was, uh, you know, it was awesome. He was, uh, you know, the hometown hero. Brought, you know, brought home the gold. Kids and adults and neighbors and everybody was in the front yard on the street. I don't think anybody could get by. It was just so exciting to see him and he had his gold medal on. And for East LA, he was a symbol of pride. Uh, here was one of our own young men who had uh, accomplished a gold medal. The next day, Oscar took his gold medal to the cemetery and laid it on his mother's tombstone. He had become the champion she always wanted him to be. I went to that grave and I laid down that gold medal and I just stood there crying and, 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 and trying to hug her, trying to just grab her and, and, and trying to feel her. And, and, and I remember just crying and, and, and telling her, here's your gold medal. This is what you wanted. This is what your dream was while well, it's finally fulfilled. Suddenly, De La Hoya was in the middle of an endorsement frenzy. Not only was he the only American boxer to win an Olympic gold medal, but he was also one of the best looking fighters in years. He's gorgeous, you know, which is probably the first thing that I noticed about him when I saw him on TV was, wow, that guy is really gorgeous. He was a fantastic fighter. He was a good looking kid. Uh, he was friendly, approachable, sign autographs. He had groupies well before he was old enough to have groupies. He drew from a huge segment of the population, in addition to the normal the boxing fans among the rest of the population, and he appealed to Latino fans in Mexico and in South America and all over. So he started out with a normal boxing crowd. He had a highly successful, handsome, charismatic fighter, and then he brought in this huge Latino market, which is obviously the fastest growing market in the country and the golden boy turned into a gold mine. His future was filled with promise, but the question remained, what would happen when the golden boy of East LA turned pro? Oscar de la Hoya captured the hearts of the country and of Latin America when he won the 1992 Olympic gold medal in Barcelona. He had fulfilled his dying mother's wish. Having reached this goal, de la Hoya turned pro. There's always a difference between an amateur fighter and then a professional fighter because in the amateurs, you, you can't count the knockdowns, so you're obviously trying to score as many points as you can. And in the pros, you are really mainly looking for the knockout. There was no question Oscar was a world-class amateur fighter. Whether he could be a world-class professional remained to be seen. Oscar de la Hoya embarked upon his professional career a few months after the Olympics. It was at his professional debut where he was officially nicknamed the Golden Boy. I love the name because I walk the streets, I, I go places. Oh, there goes the Golden Boy. There goes our champ. There goes the gold medal winner people all over the world. It's, it's incredible. Boxing is image, and the image was the golden boy, both in the ring and out of the ring. The golden boy won his first pro fight by knocking out Lamar Williams in the first round. After a string of more victories, Oscar was unhappy with the quality of fights that were arranged, and Team De La Hoya brought in a new promoter, Bob Arum. Arum had the clout to make Oscar a professional boxing star. Back when I was nine years old, saying, I want to have money and win a world title. So I started setting my own personal goals of winning world titles, 
of being very successful in the professional level. Once I decided to turn pro, then there was no doing a half job. No, I was gonna do it good. I was gonna give it my all. On March 5, 1994, Oscar stopped Denmark's Jimmy Bredahl in the 11th round to win his first title, the World Boxing Organization Super Featherweight Crown. He added his second title, the WBO Lightweight title, in July 1994 by knocking out Jorge Paez. But it was the match against his personal idol, Julio Cesar Chavez, in 1996 that would be his biggest challenge so far. Before Oscar even turned pro, he had, he had sparred with Chavez previously. Chavez had dropped him to one knee, dropped Oscar to one knee. So I guess uh, that was his, uh, his revenge. When Oscar and Julio Cesar Chavez were going to fight the first time, they went on a nationwide tour, actually an international tour. And they began it here in Los Angeles at the Olympic Auditorium. Now this is Oscar's hometown. And when the two fighters were announced to the crowd, Oscar got, and it was largely Mexican-American crowd, Oscar got booed. And Julio Cesar Chavez, through a translator, kind of snickered and said, I never got booed in my hometown. I was hurt. I was, I just didn't know what to do. But thanks to everything that I experienced at an early age, I would tell myself, why do I have critics? Why do I have people booing me? So here you have this kid, good looking, nice smile, great fighter, coming up in the ranks and basically coming down to a showdown with this great Mexican champion, Julio Cesar Chavez. And he had been the champion and basically a, a living legend in, in Mexico and, and in the Mexican community here in Los Angeles in East LA. And you have this kid who is Mexican, from Mexican descendants, so his parents were Mexican, but was born here, not quite all Mexican. And he's in a fight against the Mexican champion. That was a big reason why there was a lot of animosity towards Oscar. That was a you know huge, huge event you know for uh, all of Mexico. Obviously, all the Mexican fans, all of, you know Chavez fans and uh, Oscar's fans. It was a big event in itself. Just uh, you know these two people meeting in the ring. Uh, as for the fact that uh, Oscar used to idolize the guy, you know, and uh, he really respected him, and then just to you know confront him in a ring, you know, was uh, just. You know, a big, big deal. Oscar captured the WBC super lightweight title against Chavez. Despite his success, Oscar had many critics who felt that he hadn't fought enough quality opponents and thought he was just a pretty boy. He doesn't look like a boxer in the traditional Mexican-American mold, the guy who's scarred and beat up and bruised and, and uh, looks like a warrior. Oscar prides himself on getting hit as little as possible. He was Mr. Clean, he was the golden boy, he never had any scars on his face, he was, he was the guy on all the commercials and the billboards, and so he didn't look tough enough to be a fighter, and that, that was held against him. He was a good-looking kid. He was like Muhammad Ali used to say, he was pretty. You know, he didn't get hit a lot, he stayed pretty. Some of these guys start pretty, but they don't end up pretty. It's what always separated him. He was special in the ring, but he was also kind of special out of the ring. Out of the ring, Oscar began donating money to churches and urging kids to stay in school. He also began renovations on his old Olympic training ground, the 72-year-old Resurrection Gym, which eventually included a youth center. Why does it have to be so tough for them, like it was for us? He's in a position where he could do a lot of good and help these kids out. Kids now from that neighborhood, they have this hope, they have this feeling that somebody's taking care of them, that somebody's guiding them that somebody's lending, lending them a helping hand, and there's now hope for them to better their lives just the way I did. By the end of 1997, Oscar De La Hoya was pound for pound the best fighter in the world with four titles under his belt. But his boxing camp was in flux. He had won too many close calls to lesser opponents and changes in Team De La Hoya ensued. A boxer tends to have all his pressures that he has to deal with. He tends to have to be the one to go out and do it. In the final stages, they put everybody aside and they put the lights on in the ring. And it's you against this other guy. And yet the boxer is also taking care of his entourage and he's doing it for all these other people. And he's had so many different guys in that corner. Uh, 
that I think that's been a problem. I don't know that any one of the people he had as his main trainers were the right, was the right person to be that consistency. Every trainer, uh, you know, gave you know what they what they could. He learned from every trainer that he's had, and um, you know, in the sport especially, I mean, you can't be stuck at one level. You know, I mean, it's your life up in that ring. You know, I mean, you got to do what's best for you. And uh, if you're at one level, you're just stuck, and you're doing everything just just natural ability, natural talent. You know, I mean, there must be something wrong there. You know, it's time to you know move on, get somebody else that that can uh, push you to the next level. The father calls the shots. So no matter who Oscar hires, no matter who runs his career, the father is in the background making the decisions, and as soon as someone gets too close to Oscar, as soon as someone has too much control, then he's mysteriously gone because the father, I think, has lost control. Some claim that Oscar had sought his father's approval for years. He said to me that, that he would give away all his belts and all his titles and all his money for, for his father's approval, and his father wouldn't give it to him. And when you ask his father about it, he says that if I praise him too much, then he'll become complacent and he won't, he won't achieve the greatness I think is in him. With too many decision fights during 1997, Team De La Hoya not only went through some restructuring, but Oscar hinted at retirement. He had always pursued his interest in art, but now he was thinking about architecture. The golden boy planned on becoming a schoolboy. By 1997, Oscar de la Hoya was still winning fights and still successfully defending his titles. But his relationship with his trainers was in doubt, and Oscar hinted at retirement. He's always talked about the fact that he wants to be an architect. That that's his real dream. I'm going to retire when I'm 26, 27. I'm going to go to school and become an architect. And that's the other Oscar. I think that's the, the Oscar who, who, whose mother is, is, is guiding him. But the other Oscar, the, the Oscar who's being guided by his father, continues to fight. 1998, De La Hoya was riding high. After winning two knockout fights, the world champion's sex appeal was stronger than ever. Along the way, he became the father of a baby boy named Jacob by an ex-girlfriend. When his little boy, Jacob, was born, I was with him in the hospital. And to see him cry, It was incredible. It was like, wow, I have to take total responsibility now for my kid. You know, it's, it's, I have all these responsibilities around me, but now there's, there's flesh and blood that's from me. That same year, he got engaged to former Miss USA, Shana Mokler, who was expecting his second child. In May of 1999, Oscar De La Hoya was 31 and 0. On September 18th, De La Hoya faced a new challenge in Felix Trinidad, an explosive fighter from Puerto Rico. Those of us who were ringside that night and watched him fight Felix Trinidad were totally perplexed by what occurred. He had, he had been the first fighter ever to totally frustrate Trinidad, to beat him, uh, to bruise him, to, to take all the heart out of him. Through nine rounds, Oscar had that fight won. From round one through seven, eight, nine, and you could see who the, who the superior fighter was, superior boxer. 
But inexplicably, in the 10th, 11th, and 12th rounds, he backed up, he ran away, he gave away his advantage. And as the fight went on and he started to slow down and he had his opportunity to put Trinidad away, he started to back off and backpedal quite a bit. The fight was there for him through nine rounds. All he had to do was win one more round. All he had to do was stand his ground and he didn't do it. Felix Trinidad did not win that fight. Oscar de la Hoya lost it. At Oscar's post-fight party, which was intended to be a victory celebration, Oscar seemed all alone. In the middle of this huge party, he was just all alone, and he acted alone, and he felt alone, and uh, uh, he was confused, and, and he wanted somebody to tell him that it would be all right, and I, I kind of couldn't. I, it's not my, my role. It's not my job, and I wasn't sure that it would be an honest thing to say. When I had my first loss, people were like, oh my gosh, it's, it's over for Oscar, it's, that's it. He's gonna retire, and he's, he, his career is just down the drain. I was like, why? I mean, it's, it's one loss. And it was a controversial loss, from what a lot of people say. I did feel as if I won. I felt like the winner. But for certain reasons, I just didn't get the decision. And I felt kind of hurt because I felt as if I let down a lot of people. A few months later, Oscar rebounded from the loss by knocking out Daryl Coley in the seventh round. He was also enjoying life with his baby daughter, Atiana Cecilia, and his fiance. In the meantime, he opened the Cecilia Gonzalez de la Hoya Cancer Center at White Memorial Hospital in memory of his mother. Although my mom is no longer here with us physically, we know that she would always be here in our minds and in our hearts. We will always remember the fond memories of her just being the best mother in the world. <laughs> in the midst of the opening, De La Hoya was training for his next fight in June of 2000 against Sugar Shane Mosley, another kid from LA who Oscar had fought as an amateur. The Mosley fight was the exact opposite of the Trinidad fight. Oscar was so mad ab about the fact that he had backed up and run away from Trinidad that he vowed publicly to go in and slug it out with Mosley. And that's what he did. And again, like with the Trinidad fight, he got up early, he was ahead, but Mosley adjusted and Oscar didn't. Now if he had done some dancing, moved around a little bit in the later rounds and not come charging in, he could have won that fight. The best of the best, you know, you know, have to have to lose once in a while. It's a learning process. That's what it is. You know, you just become a better person, a better fighter, you know, from that. People were accepting me as a fighter now because I lost because I lost like a man. I just I never understood that. I fought twelve rounds, I fought hard, I gave an exciting performance. So people were happy with that. After the high profile loss, De La Hoya decided to take what he called a little vacation from boxing to spend more time with his fiance and baby daughter. He also decided to explore one of his other interests, which also happened to be his late mother's hobby as well, singing. I was like, what? Oscar sings? I can't believe this is too good to be true. I mean, what is this guy? I mean, this guy's handsome. He's a great athlete, he's a five-time world champ, he's won the gold medal, he's got every girl on the planet wanting to sleep with him, you know, and here he is, you know, he's a singer too. My God, it's, I mean, it's impossible. This TV host, okay, she asked me, uh, Oscar, can you uh, sing a song? Because I heard that, uh, that you can sing. I uh, started singing the song live, right there, boom. And when the show came out the next day, recording contracts left and right. Oscar had great uh, vocal abilities and that if we could work with him and he was willing to put the same discipline into that as he does into his boxing, that we could uh, in the end have a, a wonderful artist to bring to the world. Nevertheless, it wasn't easy for Oscar to record all of the tracks on the CD. You know, he was like, hey, Rudy, you know, man, I don't know. You want me to suffer to give you all this passion on the song, but I, I don't know, man. I just, you know, I'm too happy or something. And I'm like, champ, listen to me. You have to pretend this girl broke your heart, you know. Yeah, but what girl? What are you talking about? So I played a video of uh, Millie, Millie Correjero, this beautiful girl who I had worked with uh, from Puerto Rico. 
And, you know, it was like a love at first sight. And uh, he sang to her. Basically, the whole album he sang to Millie. While he was recording his debut CD, Oscar decided to shake things up within Team De La Hoya. He changed his trainer once again and left his promoter, Bob Arum. Oscar took Arum to court to end their eight-year relationship. I think that Oscar's attitude was he's lost two out of three fights, change everybody. Um, but uh, Aram certainly was not the problem. And I think that the fact that he's constantly changing people leaves a constant state of flux, a constant instability in his background, and leaves him on shaky ground when he gets in the ring. You have to change staff. You have to get better people. You have to hire and fire new people. So it's, it's just like a business. And I just felt that at that time, it was the opportunity, the right time to do it. It was also the right time to release his CD in October of 2000. It really surprised a lot of people, and that speaks to, uh, to the discipline and the hours and the passion and the commitment that he made to recording that CD. By August 2000, the relationship between Oscar and Shayna was over. He immediately made child support arrangements for their daughter, Adiana. In December, Shayna filed a $62.5 million palimony suit. Oscar had fallen in love with Millie Corajer, the woman he had visualized while recording his CD. I don't know how they got together because that wasn't me. I just introduced him through a video, and through, but uh, they, they finally met somewhere, and, um, and I think they're very happy. I'm in love, and, and people, people have to respect that. People have to embrace that because I finally met the woman of my life, you know. I finally met the person that makes me happy. De La Hoya was in love, but more legal troubles were just around the corner. By the end of 2000, Oscar De La Hoya's career was in question. Even his personal life was in flux. De La Hoya faced a $62.5 million palimony suit, and his case against promoter Bob Arum and Top Rank had yet to be settled. Yet his CD was nominated for a Grammy Award, which not only shocked the music world, but Oscar himself. It's incredible. Grammy nominated. I was like, whoa, my first album, and Grammy nominated. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's a beautiful feeling. It's like you never know, you know, how the Academy thinks. And it's just a great honor, and you should feel honor about this because, I mean, there's a lot of singers, great artists, that have never even gotten a nomination, and here you are, you know. So he, he felt very happy. We were all thrilled, and we felt that it was well-deserved. And, and we still feel that way. More good news came Oscar's way when a federal court judge declared that his promoter agreement with Aram and Top Rank violated California law and was void and unenforceable. Oscar then signed with Jerry Parencio of Univision as his new promoter. The team that I have now, the team that I have that surrounds me, that makes decisions, that helps make decisions, we have the best and the most positive team in the sport. In March of 2001, Oscar put down the microphone, returned to the ring, and defeated Arturo Gatti. It was the 33rd win of his career. I felt scared because here I lost my last fight. I took several months off. 
or what are the people gonna say? How are they gonna embrace me? How are they gonna support me? We had a full arena at, in Las Vegas. Um, the people viewing it on TV, it was a success. So it was like Oscar's back, you know? It, it was like, okay, people supported me. It was a great showing. I had a great fight. Um, I'm back. Oscar De La Hoya could continue with his boxing career, or he could go a second round as a singer. Sky's the limit, that's all I could say. I mean, anything he'd want to accomplish, I mean, it's there for him. I'd like to see that Oscar find a nice girl, you know, be in love with the girl, and get married, and have his own family. That's, that's what I want to see from Oscar, to be happy. I am very proud of Oscar. He's done incredible things. He's captured the boxing world and controlled it almost by himself for five or six years. He's been the big guy. Few of us even get our 15 minutes of fame. He's had five or six years. Oscar himself said to me one time, I, I, don't, I don't always want to be the golden boy. It's hard being the golden boy. Sometimes I'd just like to be a human being. And now he's got a chance.